Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for another edition of the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson, as we broadcast from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Stacy, I wore green today, not for St. Patrick's Day, but we're going to talk about hedges and edges and screening. I'm looking forward to that. Those are some very important topics, and we get a lot of questions on them. Oh, I'll bet you do. And uh, I'll tell you what, right off the bat, a hedge fund is not your landscaping budget, okay? It's something totally different. We're not talking finances here today. We're talking about outdoor rooms that can be created by using hedges or screens. I should say right off the bat to you, Stacy, that I don't mind a nice fence, and I kind of like fences in that I can grow vines on them. Maybe you put a few seeds in the ground and grow some morning glories or some moonflowers up a fence. So I don't have much of a problem with a, a fence in no, the landscape. Fences absolutely have their place. And of course, it's nice because you, you know, make the investment once and then you got the fence for as long as you yeah. as you can have it. and uh, But it does lack a certain softness that yes. only a plant can provide. Exactly. So we asked the question, if you're going to put in a screen or a hedge, Stacy, what do you plant? Evergreen or deciduous? That's one of the first questions that has to be answered. And then into, in addition to that, when you plant that screen or that hedge, do we plant a monoculture? all of the one of the same kind of plant or do we mix it up what's your thoughts on that well i think uh we need to back it up two steps because i think the first question for some of our listeners is probably what's the difference between a hedge and a screen ah, <laughs> so very good what do you think the difference is i think a hedge is something that we create an outdoor room with and a screen is more functional where we're trying to block something out maybe you're not getting along so well with your neighbor or maybe the compost pile in the backyard. I don't know, but that's how I see it. Air conditioners. Ah, air, conditioners air conditioners are a classic, yes. uh, a classic use for a screen. So to me, I agree. You know, a screen is uh, a, a planting that you make to screen off an unsightly view. So whether that's you know something like an air conditioner, which is really common. And of course, if you are going to plant a screen around your air conditioner, make sure you leave plenty of space in case that thing needs to be serviced or all the years of <laughs> yeah. growing that screen will be uh, down the tubes. Um, or, you know, like you said, if there's like a compost pile or your neighbor has a crummy old fence, there's lots of applications mm. for a screen. But I agree, a hedge is uh, more structural, typically, and it's meant to provide privacy and to kind of block off. It's, it's basically a wall. A screen is kind of like a wall, yeah. but a hedge is always wall-like. Wall-like. But made out of shrubs. Do we define it as plants that are five feet or taller and at least three of them, and then you have a hedge or a screen, and yet you have low-growing hedges like boxwood that can be right. very nice? That's true. Yeah. So, so structural. Yeah. Uh, it, I think most people probably do think of, of a privacy hedge, the classic, whether that's privet or arborvitae, the classic privacy hedge that you're using so people can't see into your house. Um, but you're right. You know, there's lower hedges like boxwood that people will plant that really bring structure on a, a lower scale, but to a landscape into your home and really kind of uh, complement the architecture. And those kinds are never used really for screening because right. they're a little too short. Right. Too short. But Hedges and screens can help define a space. And uh, that's why I like the use of hedge. We're living on the hedge here today, folks. And, um, and, so, and you mentioned privet hedges. <laughs> it just makes me laugh because, again, I've been in the garden center industry for years and years ago. That was the go-to hedge. Everybody planted privets. Yeah. Unreal. You know, I have made uh, a pretty penny myself when I lived on the East Coast, uh, spending time pruning privacy hedges out on Long Island in the Jersey Shore, uh, because that's what everybody plants. Yeah. Everybody plants those privet hedges. And of course, that makes sense. You know, being closer to the ocean, you could potentially have like a lot of desiccation from winter winds on evergreen plants. And, you know, these hedges, they need pruned, they need rejuvenated periodically. And uh, I have spent many a long weekend with my uh, good old friend, Nancy Thomas, pruning hedges uh, at the beaches. And, uh, you know, I bought my sewing machine that way. Ah, wow. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so there's big money in hedges. That's all I'm saying. But they, they aren't always low, high maintenance. A privet hedge generally is higher maintenance. People, it's higher maintenance. And that's why I say why why the, the popularity. So many privets out there that have been so. We need a privet investigator to look into this. That's what we need. Well, you know, we do but have I'm some. I'm glad you got your sewing machine. <laughs> We do have some very interesting privets uh, in the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs line. So we have a Golden Ticket, which is a sterile uh, privet, which is great because privet has become invasive in many, many areas. So it still has that golden color that everybody loves, but it's non-invasive, still flowers. It just doesn't set fruit. And then we have a brand new sterile Japanese privet. Now, Japanese privet is a plant that we can't really grow too, too well up here in Michigan um, it's more tender. It's kind of more of a zone okay. seven type of plant, okay. but it has also become invasive. And so we have a new sterile Japanese privet that's green, glossy, beautiful, called kindly. So uh, we've, we've got a privet investigator on the case. His name's Tom Rainey. He's in North Carolina. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, when I'm down south, like if I'm running, I've I've gone running in Florida, for example, through neighborhoods, and you're going to see plants like Podocarpus. Uh, you're going to see sea grape, oleander, because we're thinking about our zone 910 people right. here. Oh, yeah. And Clusia, the autograph plant. Boy, that's a fun plant, too. You can just autograph your name in the foliage. And then when I've spent time in uh, Texas, Nandina everywhere. I think they call it heavenly bamboo. They do. I am not sure why, because (laughs) in my opinion, there is nothing heavenly about it. It's overused. (laughs) It's funny looking. And uh, the berries are actually toxic to birds. Are they really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, hopefully birds are smart enough to not eat them. But um, yeah, Nandina is definitely, it's kind of like the uh, barberry of the South, like really overused. Oh, you see it uh, everywhere. I was I was at a friend's house in Dallas, Texas. It just this just popped in my mind. At a friend's house in Dallas, Texas, and I can give you the date, February one, two thousand three, and I remember it because he had asked me to prune his Nandina shrubs, which were out of control. Right. And I went inside the house. It was a Saturday to listen to Neil Sperry. He's the oh. garden guy in, yeah. in Texas. And uh, there was an explosion and the whole house just kind of shook. That was the Columbia disaster. Oh, my gosh. When the space shuttle blew up over uh, over Texas. Yeah, and I was inside the house listening to Neil Sperry at the time. So. Learning how to prune Nandina. Yeah. So, you know, this conversation has brought up your sewing machine and my experience with that disaster in uh, in Texas. Um, Can I share real quickly with you? uh, Well, let's just mention a few favorite hedge plants. I like to use lilacs. Such a classic choice. So beautiful. And even though they do kind of really only have that brief shining moment of flowering, I think if you have like an older house, you really can't go wrong with a classic lilac hedge. They're just, they're just classic. I love it. And of course, uh, we've got to mention limelight hydrangea. I think it's perfect. It is perfect. And you see it used as a hedge a lot. And uh, when that thing is in bloom, oh man, the whole neighborhood's going to come out to see it. It makes an excellent hedge, but it is important to understand. You asked about evergreen versus deciduous. Yeah. A limelight hydrangea hedge, a lilac hedge, those are deciduous, and that's perfectly okay. I mean, I think for us here in Michigan, not having an evergreen hedge when we're trying to, you know, get some privacy, it doesn't matter so much because we're not typically outside in exactly. the winter when they're dormant. Exactly. And then you get the excitement of a flower. But you know what? If you have an evergreen hedge and you want to give it a little pizzazz, you can grow clematis up it. That ah. was a trick that we used a lot when I was a rooftop gardener. Oh, that's outstanding. Yeah, it's, it, like it works that. really well. See, and I'm not into, I'm not really into the monoculture thing. I, okay. I would have some diversity in my hedge and use both deciduous and evergreen. Stacy, our word of the day, seeing we're talking about hedges, and I'm looking forward to plants on trial because we'll go down that evergreen you road. Bet. Uh, but the word of the day is smooths, and it's not about smoozing somebody. It's smooths, S-E, no, sorry, S-M-E-U-S-E, and it means a hole in a hedge or a wall. Oh. That comical cartoon type thing, picture it. The rabbit being chased by the dog runs through the hole under the hedge, and then the dog tries to fit through it. That's a smooze, and that's our word of the day, S-M-E-U-S-E.
So does that apply for a fence too? Because yeah. my fence with my neighbor has a smooth in it and the rabbits use it to go back and forth between our yards. A smooth is a hole in a wall or a hedge. So well, there you go. That is interesting. Did not know that. <laughs> Coming up next, Plants on Trial will continue hedge talk with a beautiful evergreen that Stacy is going to introduce us to. That's coming up next, Plants on Trial, here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacey Hervella. I'm here with Rick Weiss, and it's the part of the show where we put a plant on trial. And what that means is that we're going to talk about one of the Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs, and you're going to learn all about it, and you can make the decision if you're going to put it in your garden or not. Judge, jury, and executioner or planter <laughs> in this particular instance. Now, Rich, Rick, you were talking at the end of the last segment about um, about evergreen hedges and mixed hedges. And yes. I was wondering if you're familiar with the concept of a tapestry hedge. No. So a tapestry hedge is mixed evergreens. Oh. So you have, so it's all evergreen, but you get like a bunch of different cultivars and varieties and species. And so they all grow together, uh, you know, in, in a, have that same consistent look, but different textures and colors. And uh, it's 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 come in and out of, of popularity over the years. Oh, but it's very popular in England. I love that. Yeah. I love that. See, that's why folks watch and listen to the Gardening Simplified uh, show. Stacy, you're giving us a education here. That's outstanding. I love it. Tapestry I, head. You know, I knew education would come out at some point <laughs> in today's show. I thought it was going to be in the first segment. But congratulations Sorry. on holding out to the second one. Um, uh, so, <laughs> you know, whenever I put a plan on trial, I want it to relate to our show sure. and, the, and the things that we're talking about. Um, and so, obviously, with today's uh, episode being about hedges, I think most people, if you say, hey, imagine, envision a hedge, they're probably thinking arborvitae. Mm -hmm. And there's, that's a, there's a good reason for that. Um, arborvitae is evergreen. Um, pretty versatile in terms of, you know, its its care requirements. It can grow in sun to, you know, part shade, even in some cases some pretty deep shade. Easy to grow. And most importantly, a lot of people don't really consider this when they're thinking about plants. It's very easy and fast for growers to produce. And that means that more get on the market at a better price. And then people are just like, well, shoot, you know, I want to plant this hedge. I want this living fence, but I don't want to spend a lot of money. I don't want to wait a long time. So Arborvitae just kind of, mm. uh, you know, by default ends up becoming one of the most popular choices. But like you said, it's not the be all end all. There's lots of other options. Um, and I think, you know, there's about probably five or six really, really common Arborvitae varieties out there. Uh, you're no, people are no doubt familiar with emerald green, right. which is an eastern arborvitae, or green giant, um, which is a hybrid uh, of an eastern arborvitae and another species. And today I'm adding another option to the list of arborvitaes for hedging, and that is spring grove arborvitae. Spring grove arborvitae. Now, I'm going to take a shot at the botanical name. I was waiting for you to say it first. But I'm going to try. All right. Thuya plicata. Right. Perfect. I would say plicata, but plicata, plicata plicata. plicata. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> it, it very much is along yeah. the same line. So however That's you want great. to pronounce it, as we like to say, when it comes to botanical names, there's no wrong pronunciations, only wrong spellings. But for people keeping score at home, wouldn't we consider this a, a Western arborvitae or a western red cedar or am yes, i wrong that's in that? exactly right so okay. so the eastern arborvitae is the one that you know grows abundantly through most of the the midwest and the northeast uh and that's thuya occidentalis and then we have thuya plicata which is the western arborvitae so it's a counterpart basically on the east side of the of the u.s in canada you're going to have thuya occidentalis on the west side you're going to have thuya plicata and placata actually means in Latin braided, like plates. Oh. So P-L-A-I-T, you know, like when your hair is in plates. And the reason for that is if you actually look at the foliage of a Thuya placata, it does have a very distinctive, almost braided looking appearance. Yeah. I think all arborvitae foliage kind of has like an underwatery coral kind of look to it. Mm -hmm. But really when you when you look at them side by side, the, the foliage of Western Arborvitae is very, very distinctive. Now, the first thing that people need to know about Spring Grove Arborvitae, today's plant on trial, is that this is a big 
uh, Arbor Vitae. Yes. <laughs> oh, you go. It is the provincial tree of British Columbia, the Northwest. The time that I've spent there, uh, just what an amazing tree. There's a Lake Quinault uh, that is in the Olympic uh, National Forest, Ooh. just west of Seattle. That's where you're going to find the champion ones. I Ooh. mean, they are huge there. That sounds Ew. beautiful. But yeah. fortunately, Spring Grove doesn't get quite that large. Yay. But it is big <laughs> for a yard. So, you know, if you're th a lot of people, when they're going to plant a hedge, they want something space saving. You know, they have a city lot and they may not have a lot of real estate to plant something that's going to take up 12 to 15 feet of ground space like Spring Grove is. So, Spring Grove is about 12 to 15 feet wide, 25 to 30 feet tall. So okay. this is a plant that you're, that's for more for people who have the room for it. But for those people that do have the space for it, you are going to be rewarded with an absolutely gorgeous pyramidal arborvitae with glossy green foliage. And best of all, Spring Grove is very fast growing. So yes. if your priority is not saving space, but getting that coverage really quickly, and, you know, it can be used not just for a hedge for privacy or, or that kind of thing, but also as a windbreak, uh, as a snow break. So if you live on a road where the snow is always blowing from your front yard over the road and people are getting stuck, might be a good opportunity to plant some spring groves in your front yard and that will prevent the snow from blowing all over mm. the road. And making deep drifts. Um, and so if you have the space for it, it's a really, really nice choice. And the second thing that people need to know is that this foliage, this kind of plated um, or braided looking foliage, is if you look at them side by side, the Eastern and Western Arborvitae, the Western Arborvitae is much thicker. It's much glossier. It's much more coarse. And that gives it some measure of deer resistance. Now, uh, some measure. Some measure. <laughs> There's the key point. Some measure. And, you know, I would by no means consider this to be a deer-proof plant. <laughs> no. But, you know, generally, if I think for most people who have deer, certainly at the level that you and I have deer, uh, arborvitae is usually completely out of the question. And if you just have occasional deer stopping by or you're, you're in an area where there's more, you know, we're both in fairly urban areas, so they're more condensed, but if they have more room to disperse, it doesn't mean that arborvitae is out of the question for you, particularly as the plants mature. So that's really good news for people who have some deer and issues. And there are some mature uh, of these arborvitae in my neighborhood. And yes, the deer do leave them alone. So it's kind of a hit and miss thing. Stacy, I'm trying to figure out my mind again, having been in the garden center industry for years. Uh, most people walk in the door and say, I want one of those Abervitae things, right? Yeah. I hear that all the time. So if you say Abervitae, it's okay. That's give true. you permission. We'll probably be able to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Placata, placata. And, you know, we talked about uh, North Pole Arborvitae back at Christmas time, and we mentioned then that it is Latin for tree of life. So they, you know, that's just a common name. And it always makes me laugh because Thuya and Arborvitae, I think, are one of those rare occasions where this botanical name, the scientific name, is simpler than the common name. Yes. <laughs> Thuya yes. is a little bit simpler yes. than Arborvitae. <laughs> um, so uh, Spring Grove Arborvitae came to us from Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. Have you ever been there? Wow, no. I've oh, been. my gosh. It is an absolutely breathtaking, stunning cemetery. Um, it's an old garden cemetery. It's been around for about 175 years. And, you know, again, it was made in that garden cemetery style where um, it's very pastoral and there's just tons and tons of massive trees and absolutely amazing specimens. We were there about two years ago. And I'll tell you, my mind was just blown at the size of the trees, the diversity of trees that they have there. And so Spring Grove was on the grounds there. And uh, the hort they have a horticultural team because that's how important okay. it's actually considered an arboretum. Um, they have a horticultural team there that said, hey, this is, you know, this is really distinctive. This is much different. And so collected it and we evaluated it. And it has been a part of the Proven Winners Color Choice line for a good, you know, 15 years or more now. Mm. Um, and I would highly recommend if anybody is in the Cincinnati area, if you're passing through on your way to Florida or anything like that. Fascinating. Um, Stop for a little walk at Spring Grove Cemetery. It is absolutely worth the time. It's an amazing place. Fabulous. So uh, let me ask yeah. real quickly, 
Um, mulching at the base for this plant, is this one of those, uh, what is it, moist, well-drained soil it example plants? It definitely plant? is. Is it? it? Okay. Yep. If possible, it will It will have some drought tolerance once okay. it's established. But Arborvitae are pretty much always going to be very shallow-rooted. They're going to have shallow fibrous roots toward the surface of the soil. And so that means mulch is very, very beneficial for okay. them. That it not only helps keep the roots cool and insulated, it helps conserve moisture. And that's going to be really important to getting that fast growth rate. Because when you plant a hedge, you don't want to wait around for it to fill in. So um, a great choice for fast uh, growing hedge, evergreen hedge, if you have the space for it, that Spring Grove Arborvitae. We'll put the link to it and all more pictures and all these facts on the show notes at Gardening Simplified onair.com. We've got to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be answering your gardening questions. So please stay tuned to the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Uh, This is the part of the show where we answer your gardening questions. And I'm sure as spring is fast upon us, even if it doesn't feel like it quite yet for you, and I'd say we're there in Michigan, uh, not quite feeling the spring, at least uh, when we look around, (laughs) everything's all covered in snow and ice. Uh, But it is coming, so if you have questions, you can email them to us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just visit us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And use the contact form there. So uh, what's everybody asking this week, Rick? Well, we have a question from Rose. She says, we had a worm moon this week. Is that why I'm starting to see robins on my lawn? Now, that's interesting because some robins stick around for the entire winter. Right. But a worm moon, the tradition is, yes, it's a return to fertile soil. It's a return to insects and earthworms moving up into the uh, upper profile of the soil. And we start seeing robins move from, well, maybe the fruit off a crabapple tree to uh, eating some earthworms and hopping around the lawn. Right. As soon as that upper you know, level of the soil starts to thaw, those worms are like, finally, some air, some warmth, and blammo, robin. Blammo. <laughs> Blame old Robin. Uh, but what I thought was interesting, so Rose asked about the worm moon. And, uh, you know, I, I have often wondered about these Native American moon phase names. And so with Rose's question, I decided to dig into it a little bit deeper. So these actually come from the uh, Algonquin tribes through the Midwest and the Northeast. And uh, the, the use of these Native American moon phases became popular with the Old Farmer's Almanac. Yes, So exactly. they were the first ones to publish them. And because they're based in New England, uh, they started using the Northeastern Algonquin words for it. But there is actually the Ojibwa, which were the largest tribe in the Great Lakes area, have slightly different names for the moon phases. So uh, the Old Farmer's Almanac and the Northeastern Algonquins would say that March was the worm moon. But over here in the Great Lakes area, it's the hard crust on the snow moon. Hard crust on the snow moon. <laughs> really? And under most, I think in most years, that probably would have been true. Well, but- that blows my theory out of the water because, you know, you mentioned uh, the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes Basin. There was a captain by the name of Jonathan Carver who would visit with these Native American tribes. And uh, the theory is the worm moon refers to a different sort of worm beetle larva, oh. which begin to emerge from the thawing bark of trees and other winter hideouts at this time. So there's all kinds of theories. Well, there's a lot going on at this time of year. Yeah. So, so they all have validity. But uh, I will put a link so that you can read all of the Native American full moon names for both the uh, Northeastern Algonquins and the Ojibwa here in the Midwest. And uh, you can look forward to April's pink moon for the Algonquins or the maple sap boiling moon in April, which (laughs) I think that really says how things have changed because maple sap boiling is firmly in March these days. (laughs) Boy, (laughs) this is getting sticky. Okay. (laughs) Well, that's great. Hey, we have a question from Teresa. What did Teresa have to say today? So she is wondering about tritiscantia. So tritiscantia, of course, is a popular vine houseplant. And she says she buys a new one every year to put in her garden. And she never brings it in because she's afraid of bugs. Of bugs, you know, coming onto the plant outdoors and then bringing them in and then infecting her other plants or other houseplants that she has indoors. So she's wondering what can she do so that she can keep continue to enjoy her tritiscantia that she bought for the garden indoors. Mm, Wow. Interesting. Now, um, 
There are a lot of great varieties, and there is uh, the plant of the year, the house plant of the year is feeling flirty. Yep, it's a variegated one. And by the way, I love how you pronounce that, Tratus cantia. That's, see, that's just I how I say it. Tratus cantia. That's cool, too. Yeah, okay. All right. But I'm going to say Tratus cantia. That okay. sounds better. <laughs> Zabrina. So, you know, we're familiar with this as a house plant, easy to grow. You can take cuttings, yep. put it in water. Um, but... Going back to the, the garden center industry years for me, uh, essentially when we bring it inside, making sure to clean the plant really well. And uh, also there are houseplant granules that you can put in the soil that the plant will take up systemically uh, to improve your odds as far as bugs and insects are concerned. And then also the other super important thing with this plant is not to bring it inside in fall wet. Oh, you yeah. don't want that soil wet. Because they are quite succulent. And so too much water will definitely cause them to rot. So I have two thoughts for Teresa. Number one is one that you just hinted at. And that is that Tritoscantia is very easy to grow by cuttings. Right. So you could certainly take cuttings Good and idea. root them and then just grow them on and they'll fill in pretty quickly. And, you know, the other one I would say is that a lot of people don't fully uh, understand that there's a real difference between outdoor insects and indoor insects. And uh, not to say that outdoor insects won't come in, but they're not going to survive long. Right. Um, and, you know, usually what I have found is if a plant uh, has been grown outdoors all summer and you bring it in, any bug outbreak that you see usually happens as a result of stress. So a great example would be rosemary. So people get a rosemary to grow, you know, on their patio all season and use for barbecues and so forth. And then they say, okay, great, I'm going to bring my rosemary in. Well, rosemary is an extremely stressed plant if you Correct. try to grow it indoors. It just does not appreciate it. And that stress will cause any white fly, mealy bug, or other things that were really lurking on the plant all summer long. So it's not that they have come in. It's just that the stress of being indoors has kind of caused them to come out. Um, and so I think I don't think that's going to be as much of an issue with something like Tritoscantia, which we already know does really well as easy, an indoor plant. Easy to grow uh, and grows quickly. Uh, I like your idea of propagating uh, the plant when you bring it in. And, you know, plants in many ways are a lot like people. When we're under a lot of stress, it can have effects on our health. And I think we find the same thing with plants. I really do. Yeah. And, you know, I, yeah, certainly when they come inside, but I think overall it's, I have never had a huge issue with, you know, funky little things accompanying my plants on their transition to the indoors. You know, obviously, if it has an ant colony in it, you're not going to want to bring it indoors. <laughs> but you know, usually by October, when we start to think about bringing our plants in, those things are kind of all resolved because the insects have fled off to wherever right, they're going to be spending right. winter. So uh. um, I, I would say give it a try. And if you, if you can't make it work, then cuttings from your plant will help keep it alive for the long run. When you have ants in your plants, don't bring it inside. <laughs> There's That's, the moral That is some to the sound story. advice. Thank you. <laughs> Let's take another question here. Jim's writing to us. I heard something yesterday on the radio that house ferns are a good way to help with humidity in your house. Uh, mentioned that they can keep a good level of 50%. What kind should I get? Hmm. See, I see it the other way around. Yes, I do. I do too. So it's kind of more like rather than humidifying your house, the humidity you need to provide exactly. to get the to keep the fern alive is what's going to actually raise that humidity. Um, so you know, ferns are beautiful. They oh, really yeah. are some of the nicest house plant, and some of the hardest to grow. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I don't think any of us are gonna mince words here, um, as much as people would like them. I mean, who among us has not had a fabulous Boston fern all summer long that we've brought in and then immediately regretted regretted that because the vacuum cleaner gets a total workout. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a mess. Ferns, they really do need a lot more moisture and humidity than we can generally provide for them. So um, I would say, I mean, some of the ferns that um, people have been growing uh, successfully indoors is like a bear paw fern, Correct. rabbit fern. Rabbit's foot fern. Rabbit's There's foot, yeah. Dallas fern. There, there are a variety of ferns today. Uh, maidenhair ferns are fun to try oh, to grow. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. They <laughs> That's all worth it. need that, you know, <laughs> forgive me. I'm only humid, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. So yes, with ferns, uh, that's the difficulty, but 
Uh, don't be hung up just on Boston ferns. I think Boston ferns are great outside mm-hmm. in the summer and, and spring and summer, but bringing them inside, I think there's more manageable ferns. I mean, unless you're really like vacuuming, <laughs> I would say just let your Boston fern die and replace it the following year. So yeah, look instead for, I would say, Jim, look instead for these smaller ferns that are going to be in the house plant section of your garden center. Boston ferns are unlikely to be there. Um, and yeah, rabbit's foot is one that I think most people generally oh, yeah. have good luck with. And as beautiful as maidenhair ferns are, um, if you're willing to enjoy them as a short-term decorative plant, by all means, but please do not beat yourself up if you cannot keep a maidenhair fern alive indoors. Yeah. It's the plant. It's not you. Don't beat yourself up. We're among fronds here. All right. Continue, Stacey. Well, with that, uh, I think we're going to close this week's gardening <laughs> questions. If you have questions, please do visit us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And coming up, we have a guest. We're going to be talking composting. So I know you're not going to want to miss that. And stay tuned to the Gardening Simplified Show. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show today for branching news. That's right. It's not breaking news, but it's branching news. We're going to talk composting today. And who better than to talk composting with than Justin Morgan with Morgan Composting. Many of you may be familiar with Morgan Composting. It's the home of Dairy Dew. Justin, thanks for joining us on the Gardening Simplified Show. Hey, Rick. Thanks for having me. Uh, Justin, we thought we'd take a few moments to talk about composting. And I hear you often talk about biology or organic matter in compost. When you say biology or organic matter, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so, you know, biology is so important to our soils, as we all know. But we have a hard time wrapping our head around what biology is and how it works because we can't see it. So we've done a lot of research and we're working with Michigan State um, a lot on biology right now and finding the beneficial use because when we use dairy do in some settings, um, what that really means is these little bugs go in and they help break down some of the nutrients that we have in our soil. So what's unique about, you know, compo- high, high thermophilic compost, there's 6 billion microbial life forms in one teaspoon of high quality compost. So dairy do, you know, is a thermophilic compost. We heat it up and we create this, this living earth in there that we can't see. And as people use dairy do and they use this amendment, then they can see like it helps break down nutrients. And then when it breaks it down, it makes it available for a plant to take that nutrient up and feed the plant. And Justin, can you help our listeners understand what's the difference then between soil and compost? Yeah, so compost, um, our compost dairy do, we, we use ingredients. Um, it's a proprietary recipe. It's based around cow manure. We use carbons in there like wood chips and sawdust. And um, what we do is we, we, we turn it and um, the temperature will up to 140 degrees so it'll burn off pathogens and weed seeds. So that's an amendment, all right? Um, when we use an amendment, we want to use it like maybe hot sauce or tequila. A little bit's good, but a lot's really bad. Okay, don't use it straight. <laughs> so it's an amendment. It's our, you know, it's an amendment friend. It's not a standalone. Right. Sure. Hey, Justin, why, just a basic question. Why is cow manure so good? I mean, are, are we just trying to find a purpose to get rid of it? I mean, plants can't believe that the cows are getting rid of it because they love it so much. So why is cow manure so, so good as a soil amendment for our gardening friends? You know, there's a lot to cow manure. I don't know if anybody really understands other than the good Lord bought us because great grandpa used this years ago. Mm-hmm. And all we're doing is going back to what he did, except for just making a lot user friendly and a lot less odor than straight manure. Um, the reason we use cow manure is because we used to be dairy farmers and we had a manure problem and we decided to get creative with this because we felt like there was a value there. The nice thing that cow manure offers is a ton of minerals and things that other compost can't offer. So it's a more of a diverse compost than just a normal like leaves or grass clipping. This is a different type of compost and a different mineral and different nutrient. So is it accurate to say then that the cows kind of pre-digest the plants for compost and maybe get help uh, the 
the, the compost get a head start? Yeah, I mean, that's fair to say. So Mother Nature does some pretty wild things for us that we, we don't know yet. But in, that, in the cow, as it starts processing feed to manure, you know, there's a lot of good bacteria that happens there, just like us. But we're able to capture that, and then we're able to compost. And that biology that we're after is already starting there, and it's native to Michigan. So when you bring other biological stuff in from outside, you might not have a native biological that can perform in the soils as much as, like, something that we naturally have in a cow. And then that, obviously, that manure, we can turn it into something that's odor-free and friendly to use. You talked about minerals. Now, minerals... This is something that I'm trying to wrap my mind around. Uh, If I have good minerals in my soil, good soil amendments, I like to believe that the tomatoes I'm planting, the peppers, the cucumbers are healthier for me based on the amount of minerals that are in the soil. Now, am I way off here or is there truth to that in your opinion? Yeah, you're, you're right on track. I mean, anytime typically you have the right amount of minerals in there um, with the right balance, um, your plant's going to be more mineralized, more healthy. Um, the problem we're having, and this is uh, really what we're seeing, is people don't understand the amount of minerals and stuff we take out. So you grow a tomato plant, you can harvest the tomato. At the end of the season, if you rip that tomato out, you've taken a lot of minerals and a lot of nutrient out of that soil that you grew in, and you're taking it away from the soil. So you have to replenish that. So you could have minerals in there, but if you're not replacing the minerals, you're depleting the minerals. Interesting. Does the same apply here to worm castings? We talked about cow manure. What about worm castings? Is it, is it primarily the, uh, the fungi that is associated with worm castings that is beneficial to the plants, or is there real nutritional value there? Yeah, so this is where, you know, we're, we're really crazy, right? We have six million worms up here in the middle of Michigan. And uh, we part, we make our own worm food, we make our own worm bedding, and we have a worm farm up here. Mm-hmm. And we really dove into trying to grow our fungal side of our business and making sure that we're providing um, the right amount of um, biology and fungal in our potting soils and our, you know, compost teas and stuff like that. We want to make sure we have a balanced diet. So biology loves 120 to 150 and fungal, they don't like them hot temperatures. They like maybe like 120 and down. Mm. So we don't heat that. The, the worm castings don't get heated up because the fungal doesn't like that hot temperature. Ah. See, Stacy, I'm a fun guy. That's why I ask questions <laughs> like this. And I know Justin's going to give me a straight answer. <laughs> hey, Stacy, uh, how do you feel about soil testing for folks who are going to grow a vegetable garden this year? Stacy, do you feel a soil test is a good idea? I feel like a soil test is always a good idea. I think a lot of people think, whoa, soil tests are for serious gardeners and I'm not that serious. But, I mean, it's kind of like an x-ray. If you want to really see what's going on, a soil test is the only way to to really know that. And I think that, uh, you know, people need to know that soil tests come with some interpretation. You're not just going to get a bunch of numbers that you're like, what do I do now? (laughs) You know, you're going to have numbers and recommendations for things like applying compost at a specific you know, ratio to your square footage of a vegetable garden or a lawn or, you know, whatever it is. So I am 100% pro-soil test, whether you are a beginning gardener or an experienced gardener. You don't need to do them often. You know, your mm-hmm. soil doesn't usually change all that much. But sure. um, I think you can learn so much and really gain a better appreciation for your soil. Well, and that's good to hear because, Justin, if I recall correctly with Morgan Composting, you guys do soil testing for farmers, people who are out there growing large uh, fields of crops, and uh, uh, they seem to think that soil testing is important too. Do you agree? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I couldn't agree with me, Stacey, more. Um, you're, you're 100% right. What we ask is, is, you know, a lot of farmers, we work with over 300,000 acres in Michigan, and we ask the farmers, if you guys can get a soil test to us, we do use a third-party lab because we don't want anybody to think we're skewing the test, so we want a third-party lab. We walk, work with multiple of them, and what we do is we wait for their report, t- report card to come back. Uh-huh. And some report cards are really good. Some report cards aren't so good, right? right? And it's how they've managed them over the years, and it's okay. We look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, what's unique with us is we can make a custom blend for the farmers, we can make a custom blend and mix and match what he's deficient in to help maximize that crop that he's growing that year. 
So you've talked a lot about the nutrient aspect of compost, but what are some of the other good things that compost does for not just farmers, but for homeowners who, you know, are just trying to have a really nice looking garden or landscape? Um, yeah, the, some of the things that, uh, you know, Jerry do will provide, um, we talked about the minerals quite a bit, you know, going back to that with, with the, because of the raw ingredients we're using and they feed cattle, they feed them vitamins, which is in soil minerals. Mm-hmm. So we capture the minerals and that will help bring that tomato. You know, like when you used to bite into great grandpa's tomato, it tastes like a tomato, which is kind of neat. And now, you know, if you don't grow in high dense mineral soils, maybe sometimes it just tastes like something that's wrapped in water. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing like jalapenos, for example, if you get high mineral concentrated uh, soils and you grow a jalapeno plant, that jalapeno has more bite to it. And some people are like, why is my jalapeno so much hotter? It's because we have more minerals maybe in that soil. So that's what we're providing is more minerals. We also provide a lot of carbon in dairy dew. So a lot of organic matter. So imagine a bunch of little sponges in your soil because a lot of times our soils, I've looked at all the soil samples and they're typically less than 2% organic matter. Now that will change a little bit when you get to the thumb. We have a little muckier soils over there. But like you get to Kalkaska and way north, they're very low in organic matter. So this will help bring little sponges to help hold on to nutrients and moisture and water. And one of the limited factors for homeowners is to be able to water or not. For sure. Yeah, so a foundation moisture and retention capability in the soil. Justin, uh, finally, wanted to ask you for folks who are who have a compost pile out back, from somebody who does it on a large scale, uh, let me just ask you for those who are composting, what are the key elements to making a good compost is it time is it the ratio of elements is it moisture is it oxygen what what word what well-grounded advice do you have for our listeners and our viewers you you hit a lot of them rick i think you've tried this before (laughs) i threw you a softball (laughs) yeah you did i appreciate that it's everything you said you're 100 percent right and the one thing that people miss is the amount of you need a bigger pile. You know, a lot of times because we're using a pitchfork in our back, we can't get that pile as big as we want it. So when it shrinks down, people don't realize how fast and how much it reduces in volume. We got to keep that volume up. We got to make sure the moisture is not too dry, but not too wet. You know, you got to make sure your, your brown to green is right, your ratios. So um, there's a ton of studies on that. And what things that we didn't realize some of our homeowner friends were doing across the uh, Michigan is they're actually buying dairy dew and they'll put that as an ingredient in their dairy dew or I'm sorry, in their compost bin to help break their compost down because that's what these guys are. They're little, they're like a bunch of little, you know, uh, aggressive um, bugs that want to eat things and break them down. Well, what you're putting into your bin could be food scraps will break that down and leaves and grass clippings. All that will help get broke down if you introduce all these hungry little microbes that are looking to break things down. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, heading into spring, Justin, we're going to maintain our composture. We appreciate (laughs) your time. His name is Justin Morgan. Morgan Composting, the home of Dairy Dew. Uh, Justin, glad we could do this together today. (laughs) You guys are great. Appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Justin. Thanks so much, Justin. We are going to put Morgan Composting contact information in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. It's been a kick in the plants. Thank you very much, Stacey. Have a great week.